marketing channel. Um, Claire, do you want to tell people what you were telling me before about the sure. presentation tonight at the Memorial uh, Maritime Museum? Uh, at the Southport Community Center on Howe is going to be a program that's free to everyone at 7 o'clock tonight. It's on uh, Civil War torpedoes, ironclads, and other obstructions that one might find in the water. Chris Grimes is the speaker. Chris is a professional historian, and he, he's a wonderful son of boy with a great sense of humor. I highly recommend it. Just call the museum, let them know you're coming. It's free. Okay, great. Seven o'clock. Pardon? At the Maritime? No, it's at the South Fork Community Center. Community Center. Uh -huh. That sounds really good. It'll be fun. Okay. All right, so welcome. This is our fourth and final class of uh, challenges in South Fork history in the early 20th century. And uh, I just want to mention that I mentioned that event happening tonight. I want to mention a couple other events that are going to be happening uh, in the next week or two. On Thursday at the Southport Community Building, same place, uh, the Historical Society is going to have our general membership meeting. And um, the chairman will be talking about uh, sea shanties. And remember, we talked about the men paid fishermen and use sea shanties in order to. Um, work their, uh, when they were doing their work, to make it a little bit easier. And so they'll be talking about local history sea shanties and then other um, other locations. And there'll also be a potluck dinner. Uh, if this is your first time attending, you don't have to bring anything. You just come and enjoy the dinner, and uh, everyone's welcome, whether you're a member or not, you're welcome to come. Just check one thing. Can I use the recording on? Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, I also wanted to mention the, remember last week when you, when those of us who went on the tour, we were in the courthouse and we mentioned that there was going to be a meeting um, that night with the aldermen to talk about um, the future of that building. And um, I think my understanding is the meeting went well and you've got, the, there will be six months to talk with um, a feasibility study. Am I saying that right? Is there anything you want to add? Correct. So, which is really wonderful because, again, it's a historic building and if the community can find a, a way to, to utilize it and to keep it um, alive and vibrant, um, that's, that's a good thing. So that was the courthouse. We also talked about the Amusey Theater, and that's certainly a historic building in Southport. It was uh, completed in 1918. There is going to be a, an event um, the first couple weekends in December, long weekends. Um, it's a musical, Christmas musical show, live show, and the tickets for that are on sale now at Ricky Evans and the Colony in Carolina. So that's, and I think that usually sells out. And on December 7th, there's going to be a, a Winterfest holiday tea at the community center. It's a very nice tea. Um, they do a really good job. There's also an auction. Um, Ron Thompson, who is a, a local um, singer from the community, who's wonderful, he'll be singing. And there will, um, uh, it's a fundraiser by the Robert Work Society in the city of Southport. It's going to be, uh, their goal, the goal this year is to help with the canon that we have, the Southport Historical Society, and potentially move it over to the garrison so that more people are able to see it. Um, and then, the Southport Historical Society, our biggest fundraiser of the year, is coming up mid-December. It's our, it's the 30th annual Southport Tour of Homes, and that will be December 14th. Tickets go on sale next Monday. It always sells out, and this year there's going to be a dozen locations, 10 homes, plus two bed and breakfasts. Um, plus, I, I understand that the jail also decorates for after the tour, so we also be in jail. So, uh, the tickets go on sale next Monday. You can get those at the Visitor Center and the Police Will those also be available online? Or? Yes. And you can also get them online and just pick them up at the Visitor Center. The next thing is free. It's at it's the tree lighting, which will be on November 29th, um, which I think is the day after Thanksgiving, 5 o'clock. And um, it's very nice. It's, not, it's a nice old fashioned small town kind of event. The mayor speaks a little bit. There's some singing. There's some hot chocolate. I think they read the night before Christmas and they like the tree. And since we've talked a lot about Franklin Square in this class and now you know the history of it and the school and the kids played in there. So 
so you'll have a, a different view of it than um, you had. And speaking of Franklin Square Gallery, they are also doing a fundraiser and auction. Uh, they have a gift shop that's open um, now until the middle of December. They're also doing a silent auction um, starting the day after Thanksgiving and running to December 6th. And you can uh, bid on a variety of things like uh, kayak and sailing tours, uh, watercolor lessons, knitting lessons, pottery lessons, nutcracker tickets, face painting, chocolate party, uh, a day as a policeman. That sounds kind of cool. Um, <laughs> Pet and child portraits, jewelry, pottery paintings, and more. And all that goes towards, you remember, that's the school building. It's 115 years old. So they are raising money for, to take care of the building because, you know, Taking care of. Those are all of the events that I know coming uh, coming up. So no excuse to be bored. <laughs> and they're all. It's it's great to see how South Park has embraced the historical. Events. All right. Now our last topic: Hazel Helen and other horrific hurricanes. Which may say I just like the alliteration. And, um, <laughs> Do you remember in the first week we did um, about 100 years of history all in one class? We were doing African American education and we started the Civil War, went up into the Civil Rights Movement. It was a long, broad topic. This week we're sort of doing the opposite. We're going to talk about two very narrow points of time. We're going to talk about eight, uh, uh, like three days in 1893, in August of 1893, and we're going to talk basically about one morning in 1954. So, just a very narrow um, So, um, I even, I think most of you have been here a while, but a few people have come just in the last few months. But even if you've only been here a few months, you have probably been through a hurricane. And uh, you're used to seeing pictures like this. This is our 21st century hurricane tracking. We have satellites and computer modeling. Uh, we have 24-7 Weather Channel, Facebook, Internet, just everything. We're just overwhelmed with information every time there is just a breeze off the coast of Africa. People are like, oh, what's it going to turn into? So we know so much. We have so much warning. It's almost, it almost becomes overwhelming when we have too much information. But what if this is how you found out that um, there was going to be a hurricane? That you were just inched. <laughs> <laughs> Or should they get the storm? Is the uh, storm coming? Oh, it's pretty bad. Hey, it's a hurricane. So in 1893, there was no hurricane warning service. There was no weather department. Around the turn of the century, uh, government did start a, a weather bureau. But as far as predictions, it, it really wasn't very helpful. It was another 50 years before they could give one day's notice about hurricanes. And that was a big accomplishment. So, uh, in previous classes, we learned that uh, there are parts of North Carolina that are called the moonshine capital of the world. We learned last week that off the coast, it was during the world, world War II, it was called Tokyo Junction. North Carolina has another, the coast has another nickname, Graveyard of the Atlantic. They're never positive nicknames. <laughs> so, from the Outer Banks on down to Cape Fear, uh, that part of the, uh, the coast is known as the graveyard of the Atlantic because it's scattered with shipwrecks. It's really cluttered with shipwrecks. There are a lot of shipwrecks um, around there. And the reason is because the, there's a lot of severe weather there. And so you get all the severe weather causing a lot of heavy storms. There's also a strong current. And so underwater, the, the sands will shift, and that causes um, changes in, in the water depth that causes navigation hazards. And then one of the more dangerous areas is frying pan shoals. Um, is everybody familiar with frying pan shoals? Mm -hmm. And you can see it off of um, Ball Head, heading down sort of at an angle where all those um, shipwrecks are. And it's 20 miles of just a labyrinth of underwater sandbars which ship. And sometimes the water there is 15 feet deep. Sometimes it, there's places where it's three feet deep. So you can imagine ships are going to run around. So in 1883, um, the government set up a life-saving station on 
uh, the edge of Bald Head Island. And you can see it's right where Frank Pinchel's started, the little lightly shaded part is Frank Pinchel's. And um, the, the idea was to reduce the loss of life and cargo uh, due to shipwrecks. So they had, the keeper was Dunbar Davis. He was 40 years old at the time. He was a, um, a veteran of the Confederate, uh, of the Civil War, he fought for the Confederacy. He um, served in the coast artillery. So he served locally, he, he served basically on um, uh, Caswell, near Caswell Beach. And he had spent, he grew up here in South Florida, he spent his whole life on the water. So he, he was, um, and after he got out of the, the um, the Civil War, then he ran a, a charter boat service. So he spent his whole life on the water and really knew uh, what he was doing. They had a 1,000-pound um, surf boat that they used for their rescue missions. It had a mast and a sail that could be put up, but it very seldom was because anytime they were going out in a heavy storm, they didn't want to use a sail. You know, that could, they could, wouldn't be able to control the boat. It was mostly um, powered by you know, physical rowing. These men just would row the boats. Um, now, so that was in 1883. Then in 1889, they built another life-saving station over uh, near Caswell, near the fort. And there was some disagreement. People were like, well, why do we need two life-saving stations so close together? That just seems like a waste. But um, Dumber Davis knew and, and Dunbar Davis went over and became the keeper of that life saving station. So he was on Bald Head at the Cape Fear Station, and then when they built the Oak Island one, he came over there. And he knew that it was too big of a job because if you were on Bald Head, you were responsible for the shipwrecks from the Franklin Shoals, the whole southern coast of the island, the whole side, you know, the other side, all the way up north. That was a lot of shipwrecks by itself, and of course the, the mouth of the, the river to also cover. You know, Oak Island and um, uh, Lockwood Fall, all the way down to Lockwood Folly and Shalode and all the way down to Little River. That was just too much for one station to do. So they really did need two stations. But this whole debate about whether they should spend money, on how much money to spend on life saving, uh, had been going on nationally as well. And so in the 1870s, when they were setting up the first setting up the life saving station, there was some pushback where people didn't feel that it was necessary. And this, there's this political cartoon where um, this is Uncle Sam, and he's looking at these bodies that have washed ashore. And the caption, I don't think you can read it, it says, Death on the economy. And Uncle Sam is saying, I suppose I must spend a little on life saving service, lifeboat stations, lifeboats, surfboats, etc. But it's too bad to be obliged to waste so much money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was, especially for the people that lived inland, there really was not an understanding why the money was well spent. And unfortunately, a lot of what pushed it over the, the top and got them to spend it was concerned about the loss of commerce because when the ships went down, you lost the whole cargo, and that was a big financial loss. More of, of that than the focus on, the, on saving the lives is what pushed it over. But they did set it up. And this is the life-saving station out on Oak Island, and it was headed by Dunbar Davis for 26 years. And I know I always harp on this, but it's really hard to imagine how remote it was. It was really remote uh, there. There was nothing else out there, maybe some fishermen, maybe you know, a, few, a few stragglers, but, uh, and, and a few people maybe at the port, but there really wasn't much of the port either. So it really was just the station out there, and nothing but um, beach, miles of beach. You can see under that the, uh, the first level of the house was where they kept the boat. So you can see it looks like a garage door. That was the boat house, and that's where the, the surf boat was kept. And the, the crew, the barn and the crew, lived up on the second floor. And then up at the top is a watchtower, and that's where they would go to look out at the sea and to see if they saw any ships in trouble. This is the um, same life-saving station today. It still exists. It, it was used as a, as a life saving station from 1889 to 1938, and then in 1939 uh, they sold it and it became a private residence. So they moved it across the road. So where it was is now the Coast Guard station, and then it's been moved across the road closer to the water. And this is just some close ups of the house. You can see that the door there 
It's a, it's a narrow door that came off of a ship. And then the architecture that was used, and this was used in a lot of the stations, they all of them looked like this. It's called stick architecture. So you can see the trim that looks like sticks on it, so that's stick architecture. You can see in the far upper right um, corner where they have enclosed where the, the, uh, the boathouse was, and then they turned the first floor into uh, living quarters now. So you can see how the siding doesn't quite match because they, they've enclosed that and they put the windows there. And then on the, the side, there used to be some lean tos and some little sheds there when it was a life saving station, so they've enclosed that and made it a porch. So this is the location where it is on the map. You can see, like I said, it's across from the Coast Guard station. You can drive out there and see it from the road. The only thing I would caution you is, you know, it is a private residence. So you know, if you want to drive by and take a look, but just, you know, be nice, be respectful of the fact that people are there. Uh, so this is um, Dunbar and his crew in 1889 when that uh, building was first built. And Dunbar was 46 at the time when he took over that station. Now the men, they didn't know a lot about hurricanes back then. They didn't even really understand that they moved in a circular motion. They, they didn't know a lot. And you can tell that a little bit because the men worked from September 1st until April. So we know now that that's not exactly covering um, hurricane season, but they hadn't really um, you know, kept records and figured that out. They just knew occasionally bad storms would come. When they weren't working, when the crew wasn't there, his family would come over from Southport and join him. So he would work on the upkeep of the house, his wife would help take care of the residents, and the children would, um, I'm sure, would help and then also would enjoy being on the island. When they were in Southport, when his family was in Southport, um, they lived in this house. This, is, <laughs> this uh, house was built in 1885, and as you can see, it's right around the corner. Um, from us, from where we are now. So we're right next to Kazaya Park, and if you go over one street to Caswell and then up a little bit, that's the house. It is the right house, right? Jim, you know? That's Jim Raven's house. Dang. Our, our house is one just to the right of that house. <gasps> that's, uh, that's Google! One, that's 110. Google! That's 110, and, and our house is just to the right. I'm so glad you're here to tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> this is not Dunbar's house. <laughs> <laughs> it's very close. <laughs> Okay, so it's it's one block. It's one closer to. Um, yeah, it's just one closer. It's one ten. One ten. No, it's one oh eight. But it's one oh eight. This, this, this picture is one ten. This picture is one ten. The house is one oh eight. Uh, it's, it's correct. It's, uh, and I'm sure there's a plaque on it, right? Is there a plaque? Well, there there actually isn't a plaque on it. No, there isn't. We I, we hadn't done the research on it, but. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you came, and I'm sorry that I don't have the records of your house, but man, I checked Google three or four times and think of saying that's the house. Okay. So. You see, this is a very tiny well, right. Okay, yeah, and unfortunately we don't have the internet in here, so I can't bring it up. But it's right next to this house, so if you're taking a walk and you see this house. Close enough. Yeah. Do you know how they move the life saving boat across the the life saving station? I assume that it's the way they did the other ones where they put logs and. No, 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 no the boat. Well, the life saving boat. How they moved. The thousand pound boat. Oh, yeah, the ocean. Oh, no. Um, oh, I've heard there's a lot more than that. I've heard there's a lot more than that. Unless the crew was large and it was just the people. Um, station Chickamauga. Mm -hmm. And now our bank's actually done a presentation of it. But yeah, Ooh, it's it a boy. Like, yeah. And that's probably one of, the reasons, one of the reasons why they actually had to put one at Caswell in because you can't like launch a boat from because they would have to pull like go along shore as far as they could and then they would launch out to the side or launch use a log and a launch line out to them. But yeah, it was most a lot of times on the sources. That's a question. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so in later years, when Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Summer Davis, was back on that summer, she said it was a lovely, peaceful time. They had uh, four children still at home. They ranged in ages from 16 to 4. Um, they spent their time um, bathing in the surf, and swimming in the, there was a river behind it that they would swim in. Sometimes they would go to the old fort, they'd look for Civil War souvenirs. Um, they fished, crab, sail, they just let the land the sun, take it easy. Sometimes they would go across to, um, oh God, they'd go across
must have all had to visit the lighthouse keeper and his family, who was also Dunbar's cousin. Uh, and on Saturdays, they would head into Southport, about two miles into Southport, to get supplies and visit friends. And they had to go by boat. That's the only way to be able to go. So that was all nice, very nice. But now I'm going to tell you a story. And this is kind of a well-known story around here. And the name of it, the name of the story is The Long Day of Dunbar Davis. So just for a second, we back, you know, when you were working and uh, when you had a really long day, you just thought it was just never going to end. So here was Dunbar had a day like that. Uh, back in 1893. So on August 27th, when they went to bed, everything seemed peaceful and quiet. And they were at the end of the summer, the, the crew was coming back September 1st, so they were going to be needing to pack up the wife and the kids and take them back to Southport and get ready for the crew to come. So um, that was really pretty much all that was on their mind because they had absolutely <coughs> no idea that this was coming. Mm -hmm. You said that was September? This was August 27th. Uh, this, yeah, that was the night when we went to bed. It was so, as a rule back then, hurricanes didn't have names. This one in particular does have a name. It's uh, sometimes called the Sea Islands Hurricane. And the reason is because it tore through the Sea Islands off the Georgia coast and it killed between 1,000 and 2,000 people. And it hit, it hit Savannah and then it turned northward. So there were eight ships out in the water between Savannah and Southport when it hit, and all of those ships disappeared. There's no, no record of what happened to them. They were just gone. 55 crewmen um, and one passenger, and um, 3,000 tons of shipping was just lost, never to be seen again. But fortunately for Southport, the, the storm veered a little bit, and we didn't get the full brunt of it. Um, but as you know, even if you get the outer bands of the storm, it can be pretty severe. We did get, we still got hurricane force winds, we just didn't get the full force of that, um, of the hurricane. We got the edges. So about midnight uh, that night, while Dunbar was sleeping, probably had, had wakened up due to the wind. Um, but at the, about midnight, um, the, um, this ship, the well, not like this, what it called the Three Sisters, um, that was fully loaded with pine lumber, it was bringing up from Savannah, it was off the frying pan shoals. An hour later, it was a little further north, and by that time, the wind had reached hurricane force. And within an hour of the hurricane hitting, um, they lost their sails, they lost their mizzen mast, and the captain and the first mate were thrown overboard and drowned. So that left the cook in charge. And the cook was not, he was better at cooking than he was at sailing. He certainly didn't know how to sail in a hurricane. So he came up with a plan, and his plan was, well, he would just let it run aground. And then once it ran aground, they would be able to get off the boat and onto land. And that was like his best shot. That was all he could imagine to do. So he was just letting it go, because um, he had no clue. So um, oh, that afternoon, about 12 hours after the hurricane had started, it was still, the storm was still going on. And um, the J.L. Watts was who had taken over for Dunbar Davis over on Ballhead. So he spotted the, the ship. He could tell it was in trouble. He could tell it didn't know, it looked like it was going around. So he was able to signal the ship and tell, indicate to them that they should anchor the ship and that help would be on the way, that they should not try to run a ground because he knew the ship would be destroyed, the crew would die. It was just, that was not a good plan. So he, he signaled them and they were like, okay, we'll, we'll try that. And uh, in the meantime, Dunbar also could see over the island, he could see the masts in the distance. He realized it was a ship in trouble that used to be where he um, worked, and of course they worked together. So he started heading out over to um, Baldhead to see if maybe he could help. Um, Watts, the, the keeper there, had uh, hired, he borrowed a boat and he hired somebody to help him row the five miles to Southport. So he was heading towards Southport. Dunbar was heading towards him. They met up in the middle, partway, managed to communicate, and decided that Watts would then go continue going on to Southport so he could round up some volunteers. Dunbar would go back and start getting the surf boat ready so that they could take it out. So they, they both did all of that. By the time they, um, they got back to, the, to uh, Oak Island to, to use the surf boat, it was um, Watts had gotten five men, including um, Dunbar's son in law. And, but it was 8.30 at night. So they still went forward and tried to help the ship. And it should have been 
pretty easy to go out to the ship, but the storm was still going. Getting across the river took them um, two, two hours just to get from um, Oak Island to Bald Head took them two hours. They tried to go around the back of the island to try to get to it, so they were trying to avoid going out in the open sea. So they tried to go around behind the beach and go from that way, um, where it was more protected. But they, once they um, they couldn't they couldn't get past the surf, so they went out and they just could not get to the to the boat. They kept trying and trying, and the storm was too bad, and they couldn't get out there. So they came back in, and they realized the boat was too far out for them to do any kind of rescue from land. So they beached on Bar's boat. They decided they would walk down back to the um, Ball Head Station where Watts was and use his surf boat, but because it was easy, they were going to try to get it out as opposed to trying to keep Dunbar's on around. So they headed back to that station. By that time, it was 1 o'clock in the morning. It had been 11 hours since they first saw the boat. Um, they got the surf, Watts' surf boat ready, um, and then at dawn, you know, as soon as it started getting a little bit light, they took it out into the open channel and they were able at that point to go to go toward the boat and to get to reach it. So they were able, despite the heavy seas, they were able to get the men off the boat uh, onto into their surf boat and take them to Southport where they could get some medical attention because they at that point they were sick and injured. They left the three sisters there, they left it anchored um, with the idea that after the storm was over, someone would be able to go out and tow the boat uh, back to Southport for repairs. So they went into Southport. It had been a um, very long day, it had been like over 24 hours, but it was a good day. They managed to save everybody. Uh, they let the guys go, the volunteers go. Watts went to take get the um, treatment for you know, these injured um, sailors, and Dunbar was just wanted to get home. He was tired and hungry when he went back to his, to his home. He you know, had his wife fixing some food, get some sleep. So he just looked up and looked out at the station out on Oak Island, and he could see that there was a signal flag waving, saying, indicating there was a boat in distress. So he knew there was another boat out there that he needed to help. So he had to go back and try to get the volunteers that he'd let go. <laughs> and like, come on, we're not done. <laughs> come with me. So he managed to round up several of them and get a few uh, other guys that, you know, to replace the ones that he couldn't get to come. And, um, and they headed back out to, um, to Oak Island. We found out it was his wife who had raised the, the signal flag, Mrs. Davis, had, fled, had raised it because there was uh, a German brig that was in trouble. And it was stranded about nine miles west of the station out by Lockwood's Folly. And it was being beaten to pieces. It had run around and it was just um, going to pieces. So that's what she had raised the flag. Um, so they all got there, they were getting ready to go out and, and try to figure out what they could do to, to help these men. And they got word that um, the boat had fallen, that had completely fallen apart, but that some fishermen had, uh, were there and had helped the men who had come ashore. So they were like, well, okay, maybe things have died down. So he was getting ready to let the volunteers go again. He went up to the watchtower just to take a look to see what was going on for himself and uh, see if he could see the ship that had, had fallen apart. So, he was expecting to see something like this, or maybe like this, but instead he saw this. And he thought at first he was relieved, and he thought, oh, okay, it's not as bad as we thought. That ship hasn't fallen to pieces. It can be salvaged. But then he realized, wait a minute, that's not the same ship. This is a, a three-masted schooner. This is a different ship than, um, than the one that they were talking about. And he realized there were two ships that had run aground west of the station. So there was the one, the, the German one that had fallen apart, and then there, now there was yet another ship. So then he had to tell his volunteers, no, never mind, we really do need to go out on the water and, and rescue uh, a, another ship. So they all climbed into the surf boat and started heading out nine miles down, uh, down the shore. The storm was still going on, and they, because of the, the, the storm and the waves and everything that was going on and the wind, they couldn't make any headway. They kept trying to get, they couldn't get across the, the sandbar. And they just kept rowing and rowing and trying, and they just basically were staying in the same spot. They couldn't make any headway. So they were thinking, all right, we're just going to have to go back to land. And so they started to go back when uh, a boat started coming down the river. And they're like, okay, this will this will work. And so they signaled to the boat and said, you know, would you pull us across the bar? But for some reason the boat said no.
So then um, a tugboat came after it, and they were like, hey, would you pull us across the bar? And the tug said no. And he doesn't say in his report why the boats didn't, why they said no. I don't know if they felt it was dangerous to, to um, attach and, and pull across, if that was going to endanger their ship. Or, or I don't know what the reason was, but they both turned them down and did not pull them across the bar. So they ended up having to head back uh, to the shore, and they decided they were going to have to try and rescue the ship from land. So they went back to the um, station and they loaded up, this is called an apparatus cart, and this has all of their life-saving apparatus loaded on it. And then as you can see, they just pull it, just them. And you know, I was, as I, as I was reading about this, you know, I was thinking, but you know, you've been at the beach, and you know, you're pulling your cooler, and you've got your chair, and you've got, you got your stuff in the sand, and it's hard to go, and like, where am I going to find a place? And you've gone and you've they, they had to pull this miles, miles down the beach. And they said it was not easy because the, the beach, you know, the storm had come. The, the, there were places, you know, where the, the sand was all mounted up. There were places where it was cut. There were gullies. They had to go across stuff. It was very, very slow going. So, but they persevered. And they realized they weren't going to, they weren't going to make to the ship that was in trouble um, before night. So what they did is they, they were exhausted. So they took some of the gear off and they, they put it to the, to, they, you know, hit it on the beach. And they tried to go with less and they thought, well, maybe we can help the, the one, the German boat that's broken off. Maybe we can help some of those people because we're not going to make the other one by nightfall. So they kept going, just trying to get something there. They ran into a man with, uh, who had a cart and a mule. And that man said that the, um, the people from the brig had gone to a farmhouse. The farmers had, or, fishermen had helped them. They were in a farmhouse, so they didn't need to go there. But that all of their cargo had gotten um, broken up on the beach and was also being scavenged. So one of the things that people don't realize about the life-saving station is that they're not just responsible for saving lives, they're also responsible for the cargo. And Dunbar had to report on the cargo of ships and had done everything to try to salvage the cargo, because remember it was saving commerce. So he asked the man with the mule in the cart to take him to where the shipwreck had happened to show them where that was. So that was about um, a couple miles away, and they um, they went there. This is pretty much what they found. Everything was just broken apart and destroyed, um, mostly by the the, um, the the waves and the wind and everything. It just broken up. There was only one chest that was there that was still intact. So, um, so this was by the time they reached there, they were pretty much where the the Gifford, the ship, the schooner was out there, and the schooner he had, he had been not too worried about the schooner because the schooner um, had anchored and it didn't seem to be it wasn't going to break up. It wasn't in that much distress, so he thought he had some time. But well, in the meantime, while they were making their way down the beach, the schooner had decided to I guess to help itself. So it had tried to get underway and tried to sail away, and instead it had managed to ground itself. And so it was actually now in more trouble than it had been when he started. So it, by this time it was sunset. He signaled to the schooner that they were going to help. He had told his men to light a fire so that the schooner would know people are here on shore, help is on its way. He got the hired man of the mule to help him go back and get all of that gear that they had offloaded. They needed to get that, get that piled on. But um, he said, even with the mule's help, he said we, we could make but little headway for the sand was boggy and every half mile or so we would come to deep gullies. On one of their stops they ran into a man who had an ox cart, so that was good. And also he ran into uh, Keeper Watts from the other station who had come from Southport and he had several men with him. So he got, he got the ox cart and, and you know, oxen and the cart and some more men to help. And so they were like, okay, we're, we're making headway. And that was about 10 p.m. when they um, they all ran into each other, got the gear and everything started heading back, and still by the time they made it back to where the campfire was off the screener, it was two in the morning. So they've been so he'd been working 36 hours straight on this rescue mission. So now they were going to try to rescue the ship from land. And you know, think about the Coast Guard, right? Because this is the licensing station precursor to the Coast Guard. Think about the Coast Guard and, and them coming to help. And you picture these powerful boats charging through the water, you know, you picture helicopters, things like that. It was a little bit different in uh, 
1893. So they had a thing called a Lyle gun. And we're actually going to be seeing one of these when we go this afternoon to the Maritime Museum. And it's basically, and this person in the corner there, that's David Lyle, he's the one who invented it. And it's basically like a little cannon. And they would, um, this, they, that little cylinder there is, is like a, a weight, and they would, that's what they would put in the Lyle gun. And then they would attach um, uh, lines to it, a long rope. And they would shoot that at the ship. And try to hit it. And you know, they're shooting from like half a mile away. And they will, um, when the wind hits it, you know, the wind is going to carry it downwind. So they can't aim at the boat, they have to aim like a little upwind of the boat and hope that it carries it there. And they usually would carry enough, to, um, enough rope to um, make about two shots. So I don't know if they missed after two shots, if they then had to get the rope set up again and everything. Um, this is what they carry the, the rope in. It's in a thing called a shot line box or a faking box. And because if you have that much rope, you don't want it to get tangled. So they would wind it around these pegs and have it all there. And it would be in a box. And so when they, and that's one of the things they were carrying. They were carrying on that uh, cart. They were carrying a lot of them. They were carrying a couple of these boxes of ropes that when they were ready to use them, they would take the lid off and then they would turn it over and dump it on the, on the sand so that the rope was entangled. And then they would attach it to this weight, and then they would put it in the cannon, the light gun, and they would light it. Before they would light it, they would wet the first you know, 20 yards or so of that rope because they didn't want the uh, gunpowder and the fire from the cannon to uh, burn through the rope because that would really defeat the purpose. So um, that's what they would do, and they would shoot it out at the ship and try and hit the ship while the ship is you know, tossing in the waves and the wind is blowing and everything. It's just amazing. So they did, and they actually, um, they did that. It was, again, it was 2 in the morning when they got there, so it was, you know, 4 in the morning. I don't know by the time they were ready to shoot it. And, um, but they did, and they managed to, they knew they managed to hit the ship because of the angle of the rope. They knew it was up high, and it was, it was, they knew it was dangling them. But the problem is, nobody on the boat realized that they had done it. So even though, even though they hit it, they still had to wait for, for dawn for the people, the crew on the ship, to realize that there was now a rope attached to their boat. Because the crew then had to do stuff. It wasn't enough, you know, it wasn't like Batman throwing the cat in the boat. They actually had to then get it, then they had to tie it to a mast or something tall. They had to, they would then cut it, put, put a different, um, some different uh, gear and stuff on it, run that out. They have to tie everything up. So the, the crew had a job to do. So you had to count that there was going to be people on the, the still on the boat that were capable of, you know, they weren't so injured or so weak or whatever that they could do this. And what they were trying to do was to set up their life-saving um, gear. And this is how they would get them off the boat. It was a thing called a breeches boom. And basically they would set up these ropes with the pulley and then they would attach the breeches boom, which is another thing that they were carrying on that cart. And it's basically a life preserver, and then it had bridges. You know, it had somebody's you know, your pants sewn into it so that you could climb in and then sort of sit in it. And the life preserver is there because, you know, as you're being pulled across all this water, you might get dumped. So that kind of helps keep you, you know, above water. And they would manually have a crank on that cart. You might have noticed there were some spindles with some cranks. So they're cranking, all cranking back there and pulling these ropes and bringing the person there, and then they send it back out, and then they put in another person and bring them to shore. It's very labor-intensive and frightening. Um, so they did that on that ship. There were seven men that they had to get off, so they pulled them one by one, and got them all off of the ship from way far after it was. So uh, once they got them all on there, then Dunbar loaded six of the seven men onto the ox cart, and sent them back to the station. The seventh one was the mate of the ship, and he had him stay there with him because uh, cargo had started falling off the ship, the ship started breaking apart, so he wanted him to stay there with him to help guard the cargo that was being uh, washed ashore. And so what they were decided to do was to build up the fire, and then they were talking about who was going to sleep first, and they were both exhausted, but who they were going to take turns sleeping and watching the, um, the cargo. Um, because by that time, it was, it was the afternoon of August 30th, so Dunbar had been working for 48 hours straight. Just as they were getting ready to settle down and, and uh, do that, 
they see a little boat coming. And uh, this boat is a, uh, was a ship's yawl, and it had, it was coming up, and they ran over and helped them, help it, uh, you know, beach. And there were seven men in this boat, and they were cold, wet, hungry, and exhausted, and they had a story to tell. And they said that they had been on a boat, a three-mastered schooner that named the Jenny Thomas, and it had become waterlogged about 35 miles um, from the Cape Fear. And that they had run out of food, they'd run out of water, they didn't know what to do. They had seen another ship in the distance, and so they decided what they would do is they would get into this boat, a few of them would get into this boat, go over to that ship and get assistance and get some supplies. But the problem is when they got to that vessel, which was called um, the Enchantress, they found out that that ship was also in trouble. Um, and matter of fact, it was in even worse shape because the, um, uh, the mate, had, the first mate, had been washed overboard, and the captain was injured. So instead of getting help, the captain and a few of the men said, "We'll go with you." So, so then they, so some men from the Enchantress got into the boat. So then there were seven men, half of them from the Jenny Thomas, and half of them from the Enchantress. And they just started rowing towards the direction they thought would maybe be land. And they had seen the uh, fire that the Dunbar Davis and his men had built on the shore. And so they started heading for the fire. They were like, that, that might be help. Um, so they, they got there, and um, what was it? They're still drifting there. That was the ship still drifting. So uh, Davis, in his report, said these men had been without food for four days. And so what he did is he hauled, they hauled the boat up and then he sent them towards the station. You know, he said, go there and you can get help. So he you know, gave them the directions. And then, um, then he and the, the first mate um, still waited um, longer, but you know, they couldn't leave the, um, the cargo. And so it wasn't until sunset that evening that the ox cart came back. And they thought they were going to be able to you know, get a ride <laughs> back to the station. But by that point, the oxen were exhausted, and they realized that they couldn't they couldn't use the ox cart again until morning. And so Dumber Davis said, by that time, said, by that time I was getting pretty big. I had gone without food or sleep for two days and without water for 12 hours, and had been wet the whole time. So he hired the man with the ox cart to stay there and watch the gear, and he and the mate walked back to the station. So he finally got back to the station at 9 o'clock that night. He had been working for 55 hours straight without rest, very little food, very little water. So when he got there, <laughs> he found a no, but he found the place was overrun with shipwrecked sailors because he kept sending them back to the station. So there were six from the Cape Kipper, the first one that they did, plus the mate that he brought with them, so that was seven. I mean, not the first one, the first one was in Southport, but the one that he'd been there, so they had seven there. Seven from the Jenny Thomas and the Enchantress, the one that had come in the little boat, plus that German boat where they'd gone with, they'd gone with the fishermen to the farmhouse. Well, four of those guys had decided to go to the station. So they were all there, they were all hungry, they were all thirsty, they were injured, they were practically naked, the, their clothes had gotten thrown off in the, in the surf. And so there were 18 men all together, um, plus, you know, there were still there were 13 men. They were still milling around because they um, come and helped him. So this whole time, the other hero of this story, the unsung hero of this story, was his wife, Fanny Davis, who had been managing all of this. She's got four kids, 16 to four, and then she's got these men that just keep straggling in, <laughs> and they all need help, and she was managing to you know, feed them, and clothe them, and, and bind their wounds, and get them water, and find them a place to live, or to live, to sleep, and um, to dig up some clothing for them. And uh, luckily, um, the, uh, the lighthouse keeper from uh, Oak, uh, Baldhead had come over, he and his wife had come over, and had brought um, some of their own food uh, to help share. But even so, by the time Dunbar got back there, starving, and hungry, you know, tired, all that, there was very little food left for him. <laughs> and there was no place left for him to so all the beds were taken, all the food was eaten, but he was so exhausted, he didn't care. He just curled up in the corner and went to sleep. And you can imagine, he must have been feeling every single one of his 50 years. Oh. So it was a good thing he went to sleep. 
uh, after nearly 60 hours straight. Um, and it was his, the long day of Dunmore Davis was over. Uh, and it was just in time because the next day was the last day of August. And so he needed to get his wife and kids all packed up and take him back to Southport because on September 1st, his crew was coming back. His vacation was over. <laughs> <laughs> So this is Dunbar Davis and his wife, Fanny. Uh, Dunbar Davis continued to work in the life-saving service for another 22 years mm -hmm. from that point wow. on. He retired in 1915 at the age of 72. And really that was because that's when the Coast Guard took over. Uh, they, the life-saving service and the revenue cutter service combined to create put the Coast Guard, and that was the first time they actually had any kind of retirement plan. There was none, so he just kept working. In later years, um, one of his granddaughters remembered that when she was a little girl, he would never pick her up and carry her. And you know how children think it's all about them, so she thought that meant that he didn't love her. And it wasn't until she was an adult and, and under, you know, understood what he'd gone through for 30 years of working in the life-saving service and rowing those boats and pulling those ropes and everything that he, he destroyed his shoulders. He didn't pick her up because he who no longer was able to pick up a little girl. So um, he retired to his house on Caswell Street next door to the one that I showed you. <laughs> <laughs> and he was uh, he remained a very respected member of the community. People went to him for all sorts of advice about the weather and, and um, happenings in the town because he had uh, done so much for the community. And he died in 1923 at the age of 79. His wife, Frances Price Davis, who had worked alongside him, keeping house, raising children, and taking care of all the wayward sailors that happened to come through, she lived another 26 years as a widow. And she died in 1949, just a few months shy of her 100th birthday. So now, I want to show you a five minute video of the, let me say it, Chickamauga Life Saving Station. And, uh, and it will show you, uh, there's a new demonstration of the lava and how it's used. But remember, this is a demonstration. They were doing it under pressure with the storm raging, knowing that uh, people's lives were at risk. So I think it was a bit more challenging. Let's see what starts. Here we go. In 1878, the United States Life Saving Service was officially formed, and Southern Eye Kimball was appointed its first and only superintendent. Its purpose to aid the rescue of those in peril at sea. With this formation, 280 stations were built along the east and west coasts, the Gulf, and the Great Lakes. Although life-saving stations had certainly existed prior to this formation, the stations depended on the local community for upkeep, and the unsung heroes were typically unpaid volunteers. Kimball believed that only through training and repetition could serve and sharpen their life-saving skills. The beach apparatus of buoy breaches drill was one of those skills. Although it has not been done for actual rescue for many years due to advancements in technology and new, more efficient ways of saving lives, the drill has been resurrected here and brought the Chicken Wakamaku Life Saving Station back to life. The drill was performed once a week during the summer, giving visitors to the Cape a look into the life of a surfman over a century ago. I'm real proud to say we're the only place on the planet where this drill was done by the United States Coast Guard, so that's, that's real special. Station on the ceiling! Station on the hill! Open and secure! Bow the doors! In its day, the beach apparatus was regarded as one of the most important pieces of equipment the service used. It was designed to rescue those shipwrecked within 600 yards from shore whenever rough seas precluded the launching of a boat. The wreck ball represents the mass of the ship that's been on uh, here at Hatters, Randall Law Shoals, especially Diamond Shoals, the very yard of land. Uh, wreck ball and the two gentlemen you see simulate the mass of a shipwreck and the two victims of a shipwreck. They usually carry what this thing is called the uh, Faking Box. It has the, the small shot back. Right they usually carry two of them, a couple different shots, and plenty of gunpowder. The actual gunpowder, the black powder, we use here for the drill. Just under one ounce, about seven eighths of an ounce. Uh, the gun itself, when they were using it all the time, was rated for six to eight ounces. So they were firing uh, from the beach 
1,000 yards, 1,500 yards, close to you, three quarters of a mile. So they were, I mean, they were pretty accurate when they had to do it. Three, two, one. Once this line gets out, basically it's just a, a block with one continuous line around it. And that will act as our, basically our machine and the whole rescue. We can pull one side of the line and send either out and bring the victims out of your back. Or the surfman will be acting as the victim. And he'll get in the breeches buoy, which is all the breeches buoy is a life ring with a pair of trousers on it. So that way the victim can actually sit down. Bring the victim one at a time to the beach. So, in the event that it's a large crew, a tanker, a commercial ship, um, they may have to do this 30, 40 times back and forth, back and forth. Shooting out that much rope. 
Was that just a reproduction that they had? Was, was the Lyle Gunner bigger than that? No, it's about the size of it. I mean, it's, it's actually the line they're shooting out small. And oh. what happens is they actually shoot it into the rigging. That's why they had like a mast. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to get entangled in the rigging. And what the crew on the ship, that's their job, is they actually have to pull over the larger lines. Oh, I was going to say. Right. It seemed like it was right. enough yeah. to secure a man. Right. 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 And that's the problem. And they would send out a. a like a board that had the instructions on it and what to do. Um, when I saw it, I was on one side and French on the other. But you you have to count, I mean, either the men had to know what to do and be physically capable to do it, like they weren't injured too much from the shipwreck, but also you know, they'd have to read. If they didn't know what to do, they'd have to be able to read, which that seems like a, you know, a risk. Yeah, but they would figure it out, maybe just the ingenuity, if your life depends on it, you kind of figure out what you need to do. And it would say, time to fasten this, you know, about two people through. Yeah, two people below the other one, and it signal us that it's, you're ready. So there was a lot that the, the people on the ship had to do in order to save themselves. It wasn't just you guys on shore. It was a collaborative effort. Just questions? Okay, we're going to take a seven-minute break, and then we're going to talk about 1954. Of <laughs> uh, a lot of the landmarks that we've been uh, talking about in the class. And it's really nicely done, and it comes packaged with uh, colored pencils and a sharpener. So it's all set like for a you know, stocking stuffer or just a little impulse gift. It's got great drawings. It's the person that, the artist that did this, she used to be the principal of the elementary school in Southport, and now she's retired, and so this is um, one of the things that she does with her artwork. So I just think it's a great, it's got Fort Johnson, it's got um, the jail, it's got the Chapel of the Cross, it's got a picture of downtown Southport, the, um, the Franklin Gallery, uh, Berry Ground. So there's just a lot of fun stuff here. So it's um, $10 um, package like this. So I have a few of them here, and I'll have some um, at the membership uh, meeting on Thursday. But if you want some, if you're looking for some kind of uh, gift for Christmas, I think it's a great, uh, great little. Okay, so 1954. Does anybody know what happened in 1954 in South Florida? So, uh, Margaret Harper, who uh, the, you know, the library is named after, uh, she said at the time, of course, they were the family ran the newspaper, and they still the newspaper. She said at the time that that was the storm that we would measure all other storms by. And it's been 65 years, and it's still true. We still measure everything by Hazel. And here's some statistics about Hazel just to underscore why it was so significant. It's the only Category 4 hurricane that we have record of that has that is hit uh, the area. It came, uh, hit, made landfall right at the border between South Carolina and North Carolina near Calabash and Little River. It did $136 million worth of damage in North Carolina, which would be, in today's dollars, that's $1.3 billion. I can send you these stats if you want when I send the email out. Um, the 19 people in North Carolina died, 12 of them in Brunswick County. Uh, and there were 200 injuries in North Carolina. There were 95 deaths in the United States. There were another, I think, 80 deaths in Canada. The storm just kept going. Um, and so the cost of damage in the U.S. Was, was, would have been $2.7 billion today and nearly a billion in Canada. But of course, if the storm like this hit us now, it, again, it's much more populated. Even in the 50s, it was not very populated in, um, in Brunswick County. So here's a picture of um, the waterfront in 1952, so not too long before Hazel hit. Most of the pictures that I'm going to show you were taken by Art Newton. He was a, a local artist and photographer in town, and he, he really documented a lot of uh, Hazel. <coughs> so this is a picture you can see. This is, there were the, the shrimp boats, uh, the piers, the, and the, the shrimp uh, plants. That's what those buildings are that are along the pier. Those are the, the shrimp uh, type of plants. And you can see this is the base of Hall Street the river tower there. If you look between the two piers on the land a little bit, you can see um, the um, willow fetch. So that's that's what you're looking at is the water in front of um, house room. Right today it would be like all this going on. 
This was um, about this. There were uh, 20 shrimp uh, plants uh, along the water, shrimp piers and shrimp plants, and sometimes there'd be 100 shrimp boats out front. So this is pretty much the same location from a different angle. You can see the Whittler's Bench, that tree, where that tree is, that's where the Whittler's Bench is. You can see the, uh, the river tower. You can see that white building with the, with the dark roof. That's Max Cafe, which is where Oliver's is. You can see Bay Street was still just sandy street. It was not paved. And then this is another angle through um, the Whitworth Bench looking out. So you can see this is what the waterfront looked like. Here's the waterfront. It's very peaceful, very tidy, very organized. <coughs> this is Dallas and Leela Pickett's shrimp uh, dock and boat and plant. And um, sort of a spoiler, after <laughs> uh, Hazel hit, that pier, that plant, it's all gone. The boats would survive, but they wouldn't survive in the water. They would be elsewhere by the end of the storm. So, you may be wondering um, how people of Southport got their news about weather in 1954. And believe it or not, it really revolved around this woman here. She is one of the heroes of Hurricane Hazel, her name is Jesse Stevens Taylor. Now she is the mother, I mentioned Margaret Harper recently, or a minute ago, that's um, her, she's Margaret Harper's mother, Margaret Harper's daughter. And for 60 years, she volunteered for the National Weather Service. So from uh, basically 1901 to 1961, right about, that's about the time frame, that's how long she volunteered. So every day she would take weather readings and make reports to the government and when there were storms coming, it was her job to let everyone know. So originally she would know from you know, telegraphs and then phone calls, but there really wasn't a lot of information. She, you know, they were just getting information being passed up from other places down the coast if they still had the ability to communicate with them. So what she would do is uh, because people didn't, have, people didn't have TVs back then, they didn't, uh, they had, and if they did have TVs, the weather reports were out of date. Uh, so what she would, what her job was, is that what she's holding up is a, a, a flag, a very large flag. It's red, the background is red, and it's got a big uh, black square in it. And you'll actually be seeing one when we go to the Maritime Museum today, one of her flags is hanging up on the wall. So uh, what she would do is she would go to the weather tower and she would hoist two of those flags. If there was a hurricane coming, that was the signal uh, that there was a hurricane coming with two of those flags, one on the other. And you can imagine, I mean, they're big, they're heavy, it's raining, there's, the wind is blowing, all those things are happening. So it was a lot of work. In her later years, she would get her grandsons to help her. Um, and so her grandsons were uh, Ed and Jimmy Harper, who were the photographer and the editor of the State Board Pilot. Um, they both passed away last year. Now Morgan Harper um, runs the paper. So the family's been in the, in the uh, family for, for several generations. So they were little boys, and they would go out and help her hoist the flags and get them up there when, when the weather was really rough. So um, we'll be going over there where we do our little walk. We'll see the tower where she is, and we'll show you uh, where they lived. And then we'll run out and do that. Here is the tower. This is uh, Art Newton took this picture after the storm. So you can imagine her flags went up. They were they didn't look like this when she put them up. <laughs> they were still in one piece, but the storm uh, tore them to pieces. So, by 1954, you, they were, if they were, if they had good luck, they would get uh, one day's, they could get one day's warning on a, on a hurricane. It wasn't until 1964 that they could forecast three days into the future, and it wasn't until 2001 that they could get five days in the future. And even, I mean, I guess now, you know there's a storm coming, but you don't know which way it's going to go, there's always all those models. Well, Hazel, even if they had reporting, the reporting that they have now, Hazel still would have been one of the challenges because she zigzagged around and um, she slowed down and she picked up speed and went really fast and you know, she looked like she was going to be less strong and then she came roaring in as Category 4. So she, she would have been a challenge even so. But back then, they did not, um, they did not know anything and it really wasn't until that morning 
uh, that they knew it was coming. People who we went to bed that night didn't know that there was a big storm coming. And it also made it a little bit worse because Hazel was the third storm to come through that year. The first two, it seemed like they were going to head into Southport, and then they veered off. And you know how that is. After a while, it just feels sort of like something, you know, the weather just like that's a great moment, I think. Oh. <laughs> um, people start feeling like you know you're crying bull if you're trying to make too much of anything, and so that was another reason that it was people really weren't prepared because the last two storms had missed us, so they figured, well, that's just going to happen again. Um, but this is the path that was, this is the path that it actually took. So you can see it was just not you. <laughs> It was off uh, the coast of South Carolina at 7 in the morning on October 15th, and 12 hours later by 7 in the evening, it was up in Pennsylvania. So it just barreled through. So the good part of that is, you know, we went through Florence. If it doesn't sit there, you know, it isn't causing damage by just sitting there. So that's good. It moved in and moved out quickly. Um, but the bad thing is when it's moving that quickly is it also is pushing a lot of water ahead of it and get the high storm surge. So there were no satellite images at, at that time because we hadn't, you know, if you look at your timeline, Sputnik didn't happen for a few more years. <laughs> so we didn't have satellite images, but this is what they recreated as far as the path. And they did send a plane through it. They would, they would send planes into hurricanes. And the pilot who went into that one said usually when he was in the eye of a hurricane, he could look down and see water that was calm and green. But when he was in Hazel, it was the water was, even in the eye, it was all white and foamy and choppy, and it was just quite a strong time. But nobody you knew. So this is, um, you can see that the, the water is starting to rise. And so we know um, now the water sometimes during high tides will, uh, will come in uh, into Southport. The, the timing of this was particularly bad because it was, um, it was a high tide when it hit, and it was also a full moon. And it was what they called the marsh hen moon because apparently there's marsh hens that make their nests along the river banks. And when there's um, a marsh hen moon and a tide, a, a marsh hen tide, the water rises in the river, and so that it's easier, I guess, to hunt for marsh hens because they're right on the edge of the river. That's my understanding. So the marsh hens will come up again later. But anyway, that's that's what it was called. So the water was coming in, and people were starting to watch. What I like, one of the things I like about this picture, if you look on the right hand side, the house with the, um, the porch, you can just barely make out that there's some people sitting on the porch, there's like a mom and her kids, and they're just sitting there watching the, the water uh, come through. Wait a minute, I think I can make a picture. I just want to have to do this. There. So, uh, and I think there's somebody standing on the sidewalk. But it just kind of seems poignant to me. They're just standing there saying, what do you think is going to happen? You know, what do you, what do you think? Do you think we need to be worrying? Do we need to move further up? You know, you can just see they're, they're just poised to try to find out what's going to happen. So uh, this is still before the storm hit. You can tell us before the actual storm got there because things are still standing. Um, they were pretty tight. The water's there, but the wind hasn't come yet. Because once the wind the storm passed through, this is what things started to look like. So you can see um, cars have been picked up and dropped. The boats have been floated all over the place where they don't belong. We're at, on Moore Street, and uh, multiple boats ended up on Moore Street. So you think about how far we are from the, from the river. They come up here and they're deposited uh, up here. And um, so this picture here is, this is the same house. Let me see if I can it's the house. The same. Tommy's house. Is it Tommy's house? It's Tommy Jules' house right there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I'm sorry? At Lord Street in Bay. That's, that's the Harrison's house. Oh, that's the Harrison's house. Today, that's the Harrison's house. Right? Okay. So that's the house then where the family was, you know, watching, and they got a boat in their front yard. See that? Mm -hmm. You see it? Mm -hmm. Right here. Mm -hmm. I, well, folks, a lot of the boats managed to. So here's a close up of the boat. And um, what's interesting is they obviously had the boat was tied to a pier with uh, a diesel pump. <laughs> and it came with it. It's four and off, so you can see this is there. And I, I looked, wait a minute, let me see 
<laughs> so it does say keep off. <laughs> there's diesel. I don't really understand enough to know, like, there's a, that hose that's coming out of the pump. I mean, that's the hose from the diesel, right? doesn't look very safe. Uh, okay, so here, this is the Riverside Hotel. Riverside Hotel did survive the storm, as you can see. There was uh, destruction and stuff all around. I mean, it was damaged, but they did uh, rebuild. Um, so here we're just seeing more damage. Look at the trees pulled completely out. This is um, the building on the right there. That's Dan Harrelson's grocery store that was destroyed. The white building is still standing. That's um, that's Max Cafe, and then you can see the River um, Pilots Tower, which they ended up tearing down. This is I think this looks like yacht basin. So yeah, it is. And uh, all the ships got um, you know sent out of the out of the basin. And um, this is Whitler's Bench. So you can see that it didn't survive. Um, one, one iteration of the Whitler's Bench. One thing that the, the, was fortunate for the town is at the time it hit, uh, Sunny Point was actually being built at the time. So there was construction going on. And there was a company called Diamond Construction. And they actually sent over their cranes. And they lifted all the boats up from where they weren't supposed to be and put them back in the water where they were supposed to be. And that was very nice of them. They put the town together to add them, you know, full page of the paper and thank them. So here's another way they're looking at the boats and putting them out there. But the whole waterfront was wiped out. All of the all of the shipping, shrimping piers and plants, all of the, the fueling stations, everything was was um, wiped out. So, um, Oak Island. At the time, Oak Island wasn't called Oak Island. It was incorporated in 1999. Before then, it was Long Beach, what they uh, called the area. So, uh, this is Long Beach was really hit. This is before and after Hazel. So, on the left hand side, I actually, when I first saw the picture on the left hand side, I thought that was the after because there's so few houses. But that's <laughs> just because it was, I don't know that many houses. But that's actually, that's the, the way it looked. Uh, there were 357 houses on Long Beach, and that was the road and everything. When, after Hazel went through, um, that's, the road is gone. You can see there's, there's no road. Where that little X is in the corner, that was where the curve should have been in the road. But there was no road anymore, and all the houses were gone. There were five that um, survived, and I think two of those were, were damaged. So the houses just disappeared. A lot of what happened to them is they were, um, this is the way it looked, they were picked up and taken and thrown into the marsh. So people would wander around and look for their houses and try to try to find it, try to see if they had any belongings still left, you know, if they um, had, you know, some of them had things like, you know, photo albums and things that you had in your house that you might want to try to, to recover. Um, and there was also some, um, some vandalism, you know, people said they came from away, they weren't locals that did it, um, and so then they got the National Guard out there. But they also said, as many uh, instances as you heard of somebody vandalizing, there were you know, many more instances of people reaching out and helping, and, and um, giving, you know, people uh, stayed in the high school when they didn't have any place to stay, and giving people food and shelter and clothing, and all those kind of um, things for people who really rose to the occasion. So this is another picture of Long Beach. There used to be dunes, big dunes, from what I understand, big dunes, and the dunes were wiped out um, when uh, Hazel came through. So now um, I want to show you a video um, because I really like this video. It's about, it's about 20 minutes long, but it is really worthwhile. It has first-hand interviews of people who went through the storm. It was done at the, on the, at the 50th anniversary of Hazel, so this is now the 65th anniversary of Hazel. Um, so I think it's just much more compelling for you to hear the stories from the people that went through it instead of me telling it secondhand. There's a few people that you'll see. I just want to point out who they are. There's an interview with a woman named Leela Piggott, and she is, I, I mentioned that those were her docks. Uh, she and her husband owned the docks and the, and the shrimp plant and the boats, so she, they interviewed her. There's a man um, named Hoyle Dosher. Um, you know, we talked last week about um, Dr. Dosher. Mm -hmm. This was his nephew. So just kind of to give you an idea, I mean, these people lived a long time ago. So, um, and uh, so Hoyle Dosher, Lila Piggott, in, oh, there's going to be an interview, uh, there'll be a man there talking to 
Um, I think they get his name. His name is Jay Barnes, and he is um, an authority on hurricanes in North Carolina. He's a local Southport boy who grew up here, and then he's written um, some books, and I'll have them in the additional resources on um, Hazel. Because he grew up hearing the stories about Hazel and hearing his family talk about it, and he got him really into hurricanes, and so he became uh, an expert on hurricanes. And so he'll be, he's interviewed in this video, too. I, uh, the beginning of this is cut off, so it kind of starts in, it's full blown, there's no credits in the beginning. So where, what they're doing is at the beginning, he's, um, they're flying over Long Beach, and there's a reporter that's trying to describe over the radio what he's seeing, so that's, that's what we're hearing. So let's see if it will play. Well, just before you get there, every college has been demolished. Uh, the very few papers left. It's a complete ruination. So, wow, it was smart. It was moving so quickly. That was a bad score. I'm going to show you a bit of fun. Like Big Bang, Leroy Brown wore that worst than I'll tell you that. Hopefully, that's the worst we'll ever have. Well, that Hurricane Hazel hit North Carolina. 1954. I was a corporal in the Army, assigned to field artillery, and stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. I didn't experience Hazel firsthand, but I remember reading about it in letters from home. And I'll never forget seeing the pictures later on. Like most North Carolinians, I could not believe the devastation. Hazel was one of the most devastating hurricanes ever to hit the United States, and by almost any measure, the worst storm ever hit North Carolina. Fifty years later, people still talk about Hazel. No one had a claim on me. In October 1954, President Eisenhower was running for the election. Marilyn Monroe was divorcing baseball star Joe DiMaggio. And on the waterfront was playing in theater. Here in North Carolina, Governor William B. Umstead was back in a serious illness. Teams in the new Atlantic Coast Conference were playing football. Your magic and at the beach, the fall fishing season was gearing up. On Long Beach, Jerry and Connie Helms were enjoying their honeymoon. It was a good time. Going to the beach and being with friends, that was the thing you wanted to do. Over in Southport, Hoyle Dosher was running his charter fishing business. In 1954, the industry of this time was fishing or shrinking. If you didn't do one or the other, you had to go someplace else. Leela and Dallas Pickett were running their shrinking business and wouldn't think of living anywhere else. And I will say that I don't know about a place in the world to grow up in Southport. It was just wonderful. Up in Moorhead City, Tony Seaman was a teenager working in his father's seafood restaurant called The Sanitary. They just a guy in the fish market. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it working. About 900 miles south of Moorhead City, at the Weather Bureau's Miami office, Brady Norton was hard at work, too. He was the chief weather forecaster. Norton was monitoring a trough of low pressure in the tropics. In 1954, of course, we had to reach outer space. So we had no satellites. Norton relied mostly on ship reports. On October the 5th, they told the storm with 95 mile an hour winds off the Caribbean island of Grenada. While Norton was tracking the storm, now called Hazel, he had a stroke and died. He had been working long hours and under a lot of stress to track for again, Hazel. Hazel turned to the north. Forecasters tried to pick up where Norton had left off. They were scrambling for information. There wasn't much. There really wasn't much. And what there was came by teletype. We were severely handicapped compared to what we had done. On October 12th, Hazel slammed into Haiti with winds of more than 125 miles per hour. And the rainfall from Hazel caused tremendous floods that uh, that swapped entire villages. The estimates were around a thousand dead. 
Hazel lost a lot of its punch slamming into Hades Mountains. It weakened to a tropical storm, but it was heading for the Bahamas. Even for October, the water stays very warm there, and the conditions were just right for Hazel to, to blossom back up to become a major hurricane. It did just that. Forecasters began monitoring the storm more closely, clocking winds of more than 100 miles per hour as it passed the Bahamas. Hoyle Dosher started to see the big swells in the ocean while out on his fishing trips. We know two, three days ahead of a storm, a big storm, because of the sea condition. But most people knew little <coughs> or nothing about Hazel's approach. This was the tiny article in Raleigh's paper the morning of October 14th, the headline in Wilmington's morning paper that same day. Finally, Wilmington's afternoon paper sounded the alarm just hours before the storms arrived. Largely, the people in North Carolina were not prepared for Hazel. Few had TVs, and the information in TV and radio reports was too old to rely on. And uh, I'm asking quite a lot of Sometimes the forecast was maybe 10 or 15 hours a day behind. On October 15th at 8 a.m., Hazel was 95 miles east of Charleston, South Carolina, and heading north. It was a Category 4 hurricane with 140 mile per hour winds. It was moving fast, and it was approaching on a high lunar tide. All the ingredients were there for a perfect strike. I fell on the floor, 
and he brought me into the bathroom and he said, you're going to get killed by what's coming in a little bit, but I'm not going to watch this. Up in Moorhead City, Tony Seaman's father closed his restaurant early. We went back out to the house and stayed to the house until the storm came and it rained like you know what. At Long Beach, the water was already too high for the Helms to get off the island in their car. So they headed for the nearest two-story house. By the time we got there, the water was waist deep or chest deep and getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And we were picking up pretty good too. The Helms broke into the house and watched the destruction outside. All the houses along the ocean front were being torn apart because the water was rushing right through them. We actually thought that we were going to be ran by flooding houses. All we could do was watch and wait for the impact. But there was no more time to wait. We could feel the house was shifting and we were afraid that the floor was going to give away any minute and it was time for us to get out of there. There was nothing else anywhere. As far as we could see, it was still standing except the house we were in. They tied themselves together with a blanket and grabbed a mattress to use as a raft. The water was <coughs> in the second floor window and the breakers were breaking over the top of the house. And uh, I said, we're level with water and it's coming in. And when the house goes starts to fall over, we're going out of the window and you get up the mattress and hold on the And when we got up the mattress, all of a sudden it seemed like shh, we were just gone. Tremendous damage to all the boats, docks, 
structures, houses. We did have to do what we were doing at this time, I'll tell you that. All 20 of Southport's shrimp houses and fuel docks were destroyed. In Moorhead City, the holes the Siemens had cut in the restroom floor to keep it from floating off its piles were letting water drain back out. They connected to a nearby generator and cleaned up the mess. The sanitary was the only restaurant in the area open for business the next day. We met all kinds of people. Everybody, everybody had their shoulder to the wheel doing the same thing. And we got in a bed and WPTF Radio's Carl Gertz delivered one of the first reports of Hazel's aftermath from a DC-3. Everything is gone. Here's what he saw in Long Beach. Ladies and gentlemen, I thought we'd seen some of the bad effects of the hurricane. There are hundreds of houses here. Long Beach is completely wiped out. We can see signs of the houses a hundred yards back from the beach. Well, the water's over there, and we're they in a still crazy building position now. Not the sign of a cottage here, where there was a long row of them before. The highway is completely ruined. Hazel's strongest winds, those in the upper right quadrant, hit the Brunswick County Barrier Islands broadside. And at 25 miles per hour, Hazel's forward speed was unusually fast when it hit. If it's rolling fast, you're going to get a much higher storm surge because you can push up a bigger wall of water in front of it. With that wall riding atop the high lunar tide, the storm surge rose to 18 feet. Really the highest storm tides ever recorded in North Carolina. There were 357 cottages on Long Beach before Hazel. Only five were left after, and they were severely damaged. Ten people were killed on Brunswick beaches, nine of them in Ocean Isle when the truck they were in was swept away by the storm surge. The surge in Carolina and Wrightsville Beach has reached 13 to 15 feet. At Carolina, 362 buildings were destroyed and 288 suffered major damage. At Wrightsville, 89 buildings were destroyed. 155 were severely damaged. From Topsail Island to Moorhead City, the storm surge reached 8 to 12 feet. That still is a very significant storm surge, uh, particularly for the Barrier Island communities. 210 of Topsail Island's 230 homes were destroyed, and the island's drawbridge was swept away. There was extensive damage on up the coast to Steeds Ferry, Swansboro, and the beach communities along Onslow Bay. Moorhead City saw gusts of 100 miles per hour, even though the center of the storm passed about 90 miles to the west. Hazel's eye tracked just east of the path Hurricane Franz took in 1996, passing between Raleigh and Rocky Mountain. That meant that all of eastern North Carolina was on that powerful right side of the storm. Towns like Kinston, Goldsboro, Greenville and Wilson, where trees were blown down and roofs tore off buildings. Winds gusted at 110 miles an hour at Fayetteville's airport and 90 at Raleigh's. The people of Raleigh had no clue uh, what they were about to experience. Just like Frank, trees crashed down on houses, cars, and power lines all over town. It only took Hazel six hours to pass through North Carolina. During that time, it killed 19 people and injured 200 more. It destroyed 15,000 homes and other buildings and damaged 39,000. The damage was estimated at $136 million. Today, that would be close to 10 million. But Hazel still had more to do. It cut through Virginia and Pennsylvania with a forward speed of about 50 miles an hour. Wind gusts 100 miles per hour were measured in Philadelphia. Hazel joined a low-pressure system in western New York State and caused flash floods in Toronto that killed nearly 80 people. It finally dissipated near Scandinavia. And when it was finished, Hazel had killed more than 600 people. Hazel was a long-lived hurricane uh, that left a trail of destruction from start to finish. It left a question, too. Will there be another? 
Scientists say hurricanes are part of a natural cycle that helps stabilize global temperatures. So yeah, we, we could certainly be hitting it, and, and we will. The question is when. If it's not a question of if we get hit by another hazel, but when, then perhaps the question ought to be, are we ready for it? Most people agree that we're better prepared than we were in 1954, but we have yet to be tested again by a storm that strong. And since then, a lot has changed, for better and for worse. We've gone from ship reports to satellite images and from teletypes to the internet. We're far better able to model how, how these hurricanes are developing and where they're expected to go. We now have hurricane presence. And now that information gets to the public immediately. Very well developed storm. People are far more aware now of the subtlest nuance going on in the tropical Water is out there. Mariano! Emergency management officials are better prepared. Hey, man, another lady by the name of 12. Every hurricane we have, we learn lessons. We, we sharpen our skills. Coastal homes are being built higher and stronger. But well, does it make them hurricane proof? No, it doesn't. There's far more coastal development than there was 50 years ago, putting many more people and their homes in harm's way. Hazel? 2004 would be orders of magnitude larger consequence. Any category four, five storm is going to be catastrophic. Hazel was the only category four hurricane to hit North Carolina in the 20th century. They don't come around very often, but they do come. There will be another, but never another Hazel. The National Weather Service retired the name.
And now, if you go over to Oak Island, um, right across from the Old Bridge Diner, mm -hmm. there is a marker about Hurricane Hazel. So, if, you know, it's across the street from the diner. So, if you're heading to the Oak Island Diner, over here, markers are there. And uh, so it says, uh, Category 4 storm made landfall at Long Beach October 15th, 1954, with winds over 140 miles per hour, with a 17 foot surge, 19 people killed in North Carolina. And you might recognize the two men that are unveiling the sign. That's Mr. Helms, the one who was the honeymooner who rode out the storm with his bride um, back uh, on Oak Island. And then the other man is Jay Barnes, who is the, um, the author who's written so much and done so much research on hurricanes. So they let them do and they own. So about a week after uh, the hurricane, the state court pilot, um, this was the, the headline here. And you can see towards the bottom there, hurricane couple survives hazel. Um, nine persons killed, that's an early amount. That was, there were nine persons killed on Ocean Isle. So 19 over, overall, so that's probably at that point they didn't do that. We just had that report. Um, Jim Harper, who was, James Harper, who was the editor um, of the paper, he said, there can be no quarrel with the way our people have pitched in to pick up the broken pieces. Nor can there be much question in the minds of those who know them that Brunswick County progress will be moving again at an accelerated pace. So, um, Fifty years later, they did a retrospective, the same time that they did that um, video. And he called it the most transforming event of the 20th century for this community. And I find that really interesting because now we're coming to the end of our um, history series on the 20th century. And so we know that there was you know, all of the, the, the African American education and the civil rights movement and all of those things. We know that there was World War I and World War II we hear. There was, you know, the moonshine and prohibition, all of those things happened in the 20th century, but he singled out uh, Hazel as being the one that was really the most transforming for this community. So, are there any questions on Hazel? It just makes me think the live oak trees must have roots that go down to China, because so many of them... Well, you know, we saw some in the pictures that they didn't torn out, but, yeah, well, and... Yeah, a lot of those, a lot of the oak trees were here before, before it. So, yeah. Um, so I will send you a link to that that video so you can um, watch it again and show it to your friends if you want. Um, so as far as researching nearby history, um, we've added a couple more things to our list. So as far as putting events in context, understanding the technology, I just find that fascinating to compare how people used to have to do things versus how we do. It's really gives you an idea of what their daily life is like when you start looking at um, technology and then of course weather and natural disasters play a huge role in people's lives. Yes. Is there still an active shrimp business now? In Southport? Yes. I don't want to so it's not a process. Not a process. Oh, yes. not a process of the packing Um, and as far as exploring, then the other item is museums. And so today we're going to take our, our walk down to the, to the waterfront and then we'll head to the, go to the Maritime Museum. So that's the other, um, the other one. So I can send you this list as well now that we've completed the list so that you guys have this to you know, one of your own research on nearby history. You have some ideas of where to start and the things that we've talked about in the last four weeks. So now we've finished our syllabus. These are we finished our four topics that we said we were going to do in the beginning. We met those goals. And if you remember, I had four other goals for you at the beginning of the class that I kind of was hoping that you would um, at least be exposed to or get, an, get a chance to do. So I want to kind of look back on that. Um, one I said by studying nearby history, the idea was to help create a sense of belonging and connection to place, um, to develop an intimate connection to historical events to learn how to participate in the investigation yourself, and to draw lessons and gain perspectives on current events. So I guess I'm just reaching out to check, do you, do you feel like you, you met those goals? Do you feel like you have a, a stronger sense of Southport as a community and better connection to it and what it went through as far as world events and how it affected, affected people? Yes, it's an okay to do this.
fun and the learning does not have to end. <laughs> so here's the things you can do. You can stay connected with us on Facebook. Uh, we have uh, every day there's an update on Facebook of something uh, something historical in Southport. So pictures from the way it was, the paper piles of those, put up those old you know, videos, uh, pictures, things like that. So uh, we're Southport Historical Society on Facebook. You can attend the general membership meetings. There's one on Thursday. We have them five times a year. Uh, participate in the second Tuesday talks. We've talked about those. They're once a month. They're right here on the second Tuesdays at 10.30. You can enroll in future classes. Uh, I, I'm going to be putting together one, um, hopefully for next fall, that will be more centered on the 1800s. There's going to be another uh, session of this class next March. Uh, enrollment has just opened up for that. If you have any friends that you think might enjoy taking it, you know, mention it to them and <coughs> let them know. Um, so that's another one. Um, you can visit our website, SouthportHistoricalSociety.org, the Susie Carson online research room. There's all, <coughs> all the pictures that you've seen, all the black and white pictures, most of those historical pictures all came from the Susie Carson um, online research room. You're welcome to volunteer. We have lots of opportunities for volunteering. I can send out more information with that when I send out your um, email with additional resources. And of course, becoming members um, of the society uh, but you can volunteer and get on them. Okay, so that's all those things. And now we're going to clean up the room. We want to keep 10 chairs so we don't fold up. We'll put the rest in there, we'll put the tables back, and then we're going to take a, a little walk in there that's coming. So go down there, and if you want, you can use it. You can't do the walk, you can use it for the